This episode is brought to us by CS Instant Coffee, the only coffee that I've taken in the backcountry and actually enjoyed. So if you'd like to check them out, go to csinstant.coffee and use the code ADVENTURE at checkout for 20% off. It was cold. It was, it was easy 20, 25 below zero. And at that point, you know, we came over the top and all of a sudden the wind changed and the wind started to gust and swirl in our direction. When you're out there, there isn't a way to get to any shelter. You just, there is no going back. This is the Adventure Sports Podcast, I'm trying to help you find adventure every day in any stage of life. You're going to hear from explorers, adventurers, business owners, and anyone living their life a little more out of the box than usual. You know, a lot of us have had the advantage of being able to discover the outdoors, adventure, national parks, running, biking, whatever it is for you. We've been able to do it from a young age. You know, we had parents that are into it or, or aunts or uncles or grandparents. Um, I, I was introduced to the outdoors through hunting and fishing uh, early on in, in down in Florida and then moved into more of the adventure sports. Um, but for a lot of us, you know, we, we've never had that opportunity and it can seem really daunting. We walk into a store, we walk into a, a group of people who know what they're doing. It can be intimidating. But today we're talking to somebody, Scott Newman, who who didn't get into adventure sports until his 40s. And this episode's from a few years back and Kurt's doing the interview. And I just want to say if you're out there and you've never done something and you feel like, you know, your quote time has passed, I want to say, no, no it absolutely hasn't. Um, you know, I've, I've met a lot of people who, who didn't even start until their 60s or 70s even, and now they are doing things that even people that are career adventures haven't even done. And so if you're out there and you feel like you're behind, I just want to encourage you and say, you're not. Uh, this is a world that does not require lifelong commitment. You can start whenever and however you can or you want to. And don't let anyone make you feel like you are inadequate for getting started later in life. So if that's you, I just encourage you again, get out there and have some fun. Hello and welcome again to the Adventure Sports Podcast. Today we have Scott Newman with us. And Scott is here to talk about starting adventure sports a little later in life and the impact that it can have on a person who didn't grow up doing this stuff. And I'm excited to talk to him about it. Scott is also the owner and CEO, founder, and co-creator of Spin Can See. And we're going to talk about that product a little bit at the end of the show. The uh, It's a defogger for all sorts of adventure sports, for masks and things like that. And I personally have some challenges with that. I'm sure that you do too. So I'm interested to hear what Scott has to say about that. But our adventure sports that we're talking about are primarily winter hiking and also some summer boating, but overnight winter backpacking trips. We love that stuff on the Adventure Sports Podcast. So let's start out, Scott, with who you are. You grew up in Massachusetts, and you're still there now. So what's a little bit of your history? Yep, grew up in Massachusetts. I um, was born about 25 minutes south of Boston, and I live right near Fenway Park now. Um, I went to Clark University in Worcester and uh, still live in Massachusetts, work in Massachusetts, raised my daughter in Massachusetts. So Massachusetts is not a big state, but man, is it a famous state. What would you say are some of the advantages or highlights of the state that that really stand out? Uh, Well, for me, um, the outdoor portion of it, of course, because I can get up into the whites in in New Hampshire pretty quickly in a matter of a couple of hours. Uh, We're right near the ocean, so summertime's all about boating. It gives me everything that I need, uh, you know, as a person who likes to be outdoors. Uh, Small state, but very convenient to a lot of things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you have Cape Cod there. You have, uh, like you said, you're so close to the White Mountains. You'd be surprised uh, about an island called Nantucket, how much hiking there is actually on Nantucket. Well, there you go. There's a lot of hiking. Yeah. Wow. So... You said that you started adventure sports later in life. Let's just dive into that because I think that that's a, a cool story. A lot of people grow up with uh, active families and as kids, they are exposed to the outdoors and that sort of thing. But that's not your story. So what is your story? 
Yeah. Um, I, uh, you know, I got to 40 years old and, you know, I'm looking at you know, what I'm doing and, and, and I'm, you know, an office guy and trying to figure out wh- how do I get outside? I'm not really, I wasn't really comfortable out with, with knowing what to do outside. So f- you know, I actually started by taking an REI guided tour, gar- guided winter trip to in New Hampshire. And that was my first foray into outdoors. And I figured that it would probably be best to go with somebody if, who knew what they were doing, because clearly I didn't. And that, you know, opened my eyes to what, what there was out there, because, you know, I was born and raised in Boston, really hadn't gone out to the woods. And it was a pretty exciting time. It really was. The guys were phenomenal. And that was the, the beginning of a, of, a, of a whole new love. Mm. And just as you said, the location, we had a mute. So where was it that you went? Um, I went to Zealand Falls. So we left, uh, we left, it's up near Bretton Woods. And um, we left from the Highland Center, which is part of AMC, Appalachian Mountain Club. And from there, we went up to uh, the Zealand Hut by Zealand Falls and uh, spent, spent, spent some time up there and back. Neat. So I have to ask, you know, what made you want to do this? You're 40 years old. You've not done it in the past. Why suddenly are you going out? Fear. Uh, Fear of the unknown. Fear of something I hadn't done. You know, at 40 years old, I was looking for something to do. I wanted to try something new that I hadn't done before. Disconnect, you know, get out of my comfort zone. And uh, I, I was fascinated by it, but knew nothing about it. That's why I tried it. So you decided to step out and do something that scared you a little bit. Yeah, you bet. Absolutely. And, and you know, for, for good reason. Every once in a while, you have to step out of the things that you're comfortable with and try something that you might not normally do. Mm. Well, was there an event in your life that kind of kicked you out the door a little bit? Or was it just a matter of, hey, I'm turned 40, I'm going to do something that scares me? Um, you know, it was, it was that turning 40 thing, right? At least it was for me anyway. Um, and you know, I wasn't a very active guy and I wanted to become a little bit more active, didn't know how to do it. And that was the reason why I tried it. I, you know, I had friends who were more active outdoors, but it wasn't something that I went along with them on, but I saw it. I got, you know, magazines about it, did some reading about it, found out what I needed to know, you know, followed the the safety tips to the T of what you're going to need for gear. I probably was over geared before I left, but uh, it was uh, just the same. It was, you know, pretty exciting couple days. Hmm. Well, let's dive into that first trip because there are a lot of people out there who like yourself want to try something new, you know, whether they do adventure sports or not, it's kind of like, Oh, I've always wanted to try X, Y, or Z. Um, What do you think the biggest obstacle was to getting out there? And actually doing your first, it, this was a winter trip, right? Yeah, it was. Wow. Okay. Yeah, it was a winter trip. So it wasn't even like I was, you know, going out and, and it was, you know, 65 degrees outside. It was, you know, five degrees outside. So it's a whole different requirement for gear. It's, you know, it, it, it's doing a little bit of research, but not too much that you're going to, you know, get overwhelmed. Um, going to a place like, uh, L.L. Bean or REI or a gear, local gear shop, love, love, love local gear shops, because they have folks that are in those stores that know everything there is to know about good gear. And they'll tell you the, the good, you know, what you need and what you don't need, but do a little reading, understand what you're getting yourself into and, but, and then, and then not get so overwhelmed by what you're reading and just get out there and do it. So the night before the trip, how did yes. you sleep? I slept just fine. <laughs> Good. <laughs> could, couldn't wait. It was, it was fantastic. You know, and it's funny because I, I, I got up to the location and, and, you know, remember it's a guided tour. So there were 10 of us and we checked in and, and the guys, you know, they brought us into a room and we went over the checklist of the gear that the gear list that they recommended. And of course, you know, I, I'm a, if it's on the list, I'm bringing it. And then there's other folks that are, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't think I needed this. Right. And, you know, as far as I'm concerned, if it's on the gear list, you know, it's recommended. Um, you know, I, I, you know, bought a pair of boots and you have to walk around the boots and break them in for a couple of weeks. And of course there were folks that didn't. And, you know, it was, it was, 
it was exciting. It was great. And, and to meet everybody, I think was the best part, you know, because I, I love meeting people that come from different parts of life and, and different, you know, backgrounds. And, and that's one of the most uh, interesting parts of being in this in, in this uh, circle, if I if you will, this community, because it really is exactly what it is, a community. Um, I have met so many wonderful and unique people over the years doing this that uh, it, it's just one of the best parts of doing it. Mm. And I've often said that on the show and for the new listeners, anytime you plug yourself into a new sport like this, you're going to make new friends. It's you a, are. It's a beautiful it, thing. It's, it, it is fantastic. And, and everybody wants, everybody's got a story. And it's just interesting to hear how everybody got to that same place that you're standing in at that point in time. You know, I, I did a trip once and I met a gentleman who was uh, much older than me and he had just finished the AT. Nice. I was just, just, I couldn't, I couldn't wait to sit down and have a cup of coffee and listen to his story about the trip and why he decided at 63 to do the AT. So, mm. well, on this first trip, it's a winter trip. You have yes. a, it sounds like a pretty heavy pack from the sound of things. Yes. And how are you managing the snow? Did you have to use snowshoes or what was it? Yeah, we had snowshoes. Snowshoes. Was this your first time out on snowshoes? It wasn't. Um, I had purchased uh, some snowshoes about a year or so before and uh, did just local stuff around the house. Maybe I wanted to get out. I'd go to a you know a local park or even just a golf course that's nearby just to walk around and be outside. And, you know, obviously I did a little bit more on my snowshoes prior to going on that trip because I wanted to make sure that I was comfortable in them and that I, you know, knew how to adjust all of the bindings that were going to need to be adjusted. And I was comfortable in walking around with them in different terrain. Right. And how many times did you step on your own heel and topple over? Yeah, way too many. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't do that anymore. Well, you have to learn to to kind of walk with your feet spread out a little bit. That's the fun part. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And 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 also finding snowshoes that are are comfortable. So you you know, you start off in your basic snowshoes and and you get to use those for a while and then you start looking at if you like it enough, you step it up to another set of snowshoes and so on down the line. Sure, you bet. Well, that's fun. And then on this first trip, when you finally took off down the trail with the group, yes, tell us how you felt. Um, I, I was once we got going, I was actually more nervous than the night before because mm. I didn't know what to expect out there. I didn't know what the train was going to be like. I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to keep up with everybody. Um, I, I didn't want to be the slow guy in the group because there are people that were you know older and younger than me. And I didn't know, you know, what, what pace we were going to move at. And I didn't know, you know, exactly how long it was going to take us to get from point A to point B. You know, mileage wise, but you don't know time wise how long it's going to take. And, you know, you're carrying that much, you know, in a pack. It's, it's the first time you're really doing it. it it's, it's interesting. It really is because your balance is completely different than when you're just walking around with like a day pack on. Right. You're carrying a pack that's got between 35 and 40 pounds on it. And it's, you know, it's weighted differently. It, it, it you know, makes you, it makes you a little bit unbalanced, but um, still, still a very good trip. Mm, that's fun. You know, one of the big challenges is when there's too much snow, it's soft. And then you step on the, the heel of your snowshoe and topple down and you've got 40 pounds on your back. And then you try to get up and you just bury your arms in the soft snow. And was that your experience? Yeah, I, I, I actually did. On the way back, um, I actually, we, were, we, we had separated into groups of, uh, into smaller groups. And I was um, in the middle of a pack and the person crossed over this small little, you know, it was a little ravine. I mean, how big could it have been? You know, just, just big enough for, for my snowshoe to go into it. And they crossed over. And just as they crossed over, the back of that that ravine broke off just as I was stepping down and my my snowshoe, my leg went down and I face planted. So, you know, <laughs> here, there I am, one leg hanging down, the other one behind me. I'm facing the snow and my backpacks on me. And, you know, it was you know, you don't know where the edge of, of that is. And and you want to be careful about how you're going to get your pack around. 
But it took about, uh, you know, five or six minutes for me to get my bearings straight and be able to get up without, you know, hurting anybody in front of me or behind me. But that was, you know, that was a little interesting. That was nerve wracking. That was my very, very <laughs> first time of really saying to myself, OK, so this is uh, these are some of the things that can happen to you out here. Um, yeah. And it was it was pretty deep down. So um, but it certainly didn't stop me from going back out again and again and again. So. Right. That, that's kind of the fun of it. I think it's so funny when you have that first experience. It's kind of like, well, I know I learned how to walk 39 years ago, <laughs> but right. somehow I'm learning all over again here. Oh, yeah. And, and, you know, as long as you come out of it and say, all right, I got myself up. I got myself out. You know, I was able to get it out of there. I was able to manage to, you know, figure out how to maneuver myself and get balanced and, and pull myself out of there. You know, it adds a, a whole new level of confidence. Yeah. Well, I have a parallel story where on one of my early overnight winter trips, I, uh, I tripped over my snowshoe and my arm went through the ice of a, a creek that we were crossing. And I was pinned down by my 40-pound pack, and I was soaking yeah. my only glove. I didn't bring an extra set of gloves, which was stupid, but yeah. I didn't know any better. And so I started panicking, thinking I could lose my fingers. I mean, this is cold, yeah. you know. Yeah. And the guys yeah. I was with were just laughing because I was trying to get up. And I, I mean, it's like a turtle on his back, except I was you yeah. know, pinned on my face. But the same sort of a thing. It's, it's like, wow, you really got to think about this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, no question about it. And, and you know, you made a good point. Um, Gear is important. Having the right gear, not having too much gear, but having the right gear is is really important. Um, you mentioned not having an extra pair of gloves. I carry I carry three pairs of gloves because you know you exert a lot of energy, you sweat a lot, and your gloves and get wet. Right. So I have you know different gloves to carry me through the different sections of the trip. Um, I happen to be leaving in uh, is today Thursday, two weeks from. Today, matter of fact. Headed out on another trip? Yeah. So where yeah. are you going this time? Headed up to the 100-mile 100, 100 wilderness. Nice. The 100-mile wilderness is the top 100 miles of the Appalachian Trail. It's, it's one of the trickiest. It's, it requires a lot more planning, a lot more endurance. Um, they're, they're, it's, it's the largest stretch of the AT without um, any other you know, places to stop or, or, or communication. So... <laughs> You're kind of there. You're kind of out there on your own, and it's 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 a um, a very interesting, beautiful place to be. But it's it's a uh, a hard course to climb. Mm. Well, it sounds like you've done several trips from you know since the first one and learned a lot yeah. about yeah. backpacking and camping in the winter time. So, what have you learned? How is it different now than it was? Um. Yeah. Well. I, I bring different food that I brought that I brought before. Um, you know, when I'm out there in, we've been in temperatures that run the gamut. Um, the the coldest temps that I've hiked in is 30 below zero. With mm. the wind chill, it's colder than that. Uh, but then we've had years that it's been mild, and we've had you know 25 degrees, and that's balmy. Um, but what you learn is what type of food uh, and nourishment you can bring out there that isn't going to freeze. That's probably, to me, one of the key pieces, that and water, making sure that you bring a container that your water isn't going to freeze because there's nothing worse than having a, you know, a bottle or, or something in it that freezes and you can't drink out of it. So what are your tricks for keeping your water from freezing? Um, I, you know, you've got your standard, uh, you know, neoprene bottle, but I have um, an insulator that I keep the bottle in and I keep it close to my chest. So where somebody else might keep it in a certain location, I keep mine right in the front. And you try to drink out of it a little bit more regularly, especially the colder the temperatures, because the top rim of the bottle is going to freeze mm -hmm. um, pretty, pretty quickly. So if you can drink out of it, you know, more regularly than you would if you were going for like a spring hike or a summer hike, it, it will keep your bottle from freezing. Uh, and and I don't use a um, like um, a sack inside my pack, a reserve inside my backpack. I keep the bottle in the front so I can get to it. I, I've actually, you know, it's funny. We're all gear guys, and and I rigged up mine in a way that it sits right in the front that I can get my hands on it. Yeah, that's handy. 
it, I often carry mine in a pouch on the side of my pack that I really can't reach. I might get it out, but I have to have someone else put it back in. And that's right. that's inconvenient. You know, that's yeah. frustrating. And I have had frozen water on winter trips and had to go without water for nine plus hours. So Yeah, and, and that that's hard. That's hard because you're moving at a very, very slow pace. You're using, you know, a lot of muscles that you wouldn't normally use and you're getting tired really fast and not having access to water is a, could be a problem. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a, it's a safety hazard, frankly. Yeah, very much so. Another trick I've learned is to store my water bottle upside down. That way, if it does start to freeze, it's going to freeze on what is the bottom and I can still get (laughs) water out of it when I flip it over. Yeah. You know, I've heard that before. I, I, I met a person on the, on a trip once who told me to do that very same thing. You know, so far I've been lucky where, you know, I found something that works for me, but that's definitely smart. You, you know, the other thing is if you do have a reserve with a tube, just make sure you blow back into it so you can blow whatever moisture could potentially freeze on the drinking end of the tube. Yeah, you know, and when it's kind of funny because we're talking about drinking water. We were talking earlier about learning to walk. Do you get a theme yeah. here? You know, we're talking yeah. about you go out in the wintertime on these trips and things that you've always taken for granted now matter and they're different right. and you're learning new skills and tricks and hacks, right, to make yeah. it all work. Yeah. But isn't that what it's about? It's, it's the discovery. It, it really is. And, you know, um, you know, it's very that's a very good point. The discovery, discovery, how to be, you know, safe, how to be diligent, um, how to make sure that that somebody knows where you're supposed to be at, at any given point in time, right? Making sure that if you're supposed to leave at a certain point in time, you leave at that certain point in time. And if you, if somebody's expecting you at a certain point that you get there because, and tell somebody you get there, it's very much like boating when you have a float plan of, of making sure that there is somebody else that knows where you're supposed to be. Yeah. You never know when you might need the help. And no. so it's, it, that really is critically important. And I think some of the real tragedy stories that we hear, uh, most of them start that way. Well, no one really knew where I was going, what right. time I was supposed to get back, that sort of right. a thing. So, yeah, there's so many things that we have to learn when we take on a new sport. But isn't it fun? On this first trip, let's go back to the first one. Sure. Um, you went out with some set of expectations. You know, you geared up for it. You did some reading. You took a guide so that you could learn you know, the stuff you may not know that you don't know, right? Yep. But what was the experience like? I, you're still doing it, so it must have been positive. Yeah, um, the experience was was obviously great. The, the guides were the key to success for me because, you know, they took the anxiety out of the trip. You know, they set the pace. They told you what to expect. They made sure that you had the right gear and they taught you about the gear. This is what you need this for. This is why you have this. This is, you know, you might not need this, but this is the reason we carry it. And, and, you know, after that, you get a chance to understand what their gear is, right? Because just because they put on your list what gear you should have doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have different uh, gear things on in their pack. And for me, it was understanding what I needed, why I needed it. And and then just being able to enjoy the outdoors and be there and not be uh, nervous about the unknown that I can indeed read a map and get from point A to point B. And to me, that was that was the first step. And once I got past that, I was like, OK, now I can start doing this on my own. I, I, I generally go hiking with another person. I rarely do I go hiking by myself on occasion, but rarely on long trips. I go with I definitely go with somebody else. And it's, it's being able to um, appreciate the outdoors. I understand that you're there, you're there to enjoy it, but don't take advantage of it. You're there to make sure that you're, in, you, you're, you're there to enjoy it. There was somebody bef- before you that was there to enjoy it, and there's going to be somebody after you that's going to be there to enjoy it. So that was a good piece to learn. Oh, yeah. Was there a point on that first trip where you had to question the sanity of what you were doing or did it all go pretty smoothly? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. When, when I got into my sleeping bag at night at night and I had to bring all of my stuff in, including my toothbrush, my toothpaste and my contact lenses because everything was going to freeze, <laughs> you know, um, I put my headlamp on, I'm, you know, reading a book and, and I'm saying to myself, 
Okay, so how important is it really to have to go to the loo? Right. And I was like, you know, it really isn't all that important right now. And, <laughs> you know, it's, it's points in time like that you say to yourself, all right, all right, and I'm, I'm, I'm here, why? And then you get up the next morning and you say you get outside and you, you get some, you have to go get water and you bring it in, you make yourself some coffee, which usually is the worst cup of coffee you've ever had in your life. And, and you say to yourself, this is the reason why you, you can't, you can't get this view. You can't get this experience unless you do the work to get here. Right. And, uh, and that's it. You, you, and you and I can have these conversations and, and how wonderful it is, but you got to get, you know, out of, out of your comfort zone. You got to get out of the city. You got to go someplace and, and you have to put the work to get from point A to point B to be able to experience the pictures that you and I pr- probably take on our trip. Yeah, exactly. I think that uh, mountaineering is an example. People come to Colorado and they drive to the top of Mount Evans or Pikes Peak and they see the amazing views and it is amazing, right? And usually they're awestruck. But then the people that take the next step and actually hike to the top of one of the big mountains. Then when they get to see the view, it's a totally different experience. And until you've done it, it's hard to explain why. But when you walk up that thing, oh, yeah. when, when you put the energy into it, and you get to the top, then it's not a, wow, this is pretty and amazing. Then it's a, it's a completely different experience. It's exhilarating. You get a, an endorphin rush, and you appreciate the mountain so much more. It's like, I know this mountain. I touched it, you know? It fought against me all the way to the top. And here I am standing on top of this bad boy. You know what I mean? It, it, it Absolutely. I had one climb that I took that the last stretch was so steep that I couldn't do it with my pack on. So I, I left it down below and and hiked up to the top and it and it was... It was worth it. There was only one way of getting there. And I had climbed this far. There was no chance I wasn't going to make the last, you know, <laughs> 65 feet. Right. Oh, man. So. Well, and that really is it. It's hard to explain. It's just a reason why we have to say, go try it. You know, when you wake up in the morning and you see the beauty of the early morning in the, in, in the snowy woods, you're drinking something hot and, and looking around and saying, wow, wow. It's just, it, it, it's remarkable. And you, you know, you're staring there, you're looking at it and, and the sun's shining or it's not, and it's snowing or it's not. And it doesn't matter because every time you go there, it's going to be completely different than the last time you were there. Yeah. The yeah. people you're with, the experience, the view, the landscape, it's all just different. So you go from one year to the next and it's a completely different experience from the one you had before. Which also makes it very interesting because it makes it so that you might want to do the same trail over again and think that it might be boring, but it isn't because it's different than the last time you did it. Yeah, especially in the wintertime. Oh, yeah. You're always going to have a different completely experience. completely different. Oh, yeah. Yep. And, 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 and you don't know what you're going to get. Last year, we had uh, a huge base layer of snow, and we went out on a hike, and the trail none of the trails had been broken in. So... Not only are you going for a hike, but you're breaking trail for how many hours? However many hours you can go. That's not um, easy. No, not at all. Yeah. Wild, wild stuff. So let's let's reflect on this for just a moment. The pre-40-year-old Scott, who had never done yes. this, was one guy. Now we're talking about the Scott who's done this for a while. Yes. And uh, how did it change your life? How did it impact you personally? Well, first... Um, you know, my daughter, who is now So 20, we want to thank our sponsor, um, Athletic Brewing, for she promoting got a healthy lifestyle through some. making some of the you know, world's gave, best you know, non-alcoholic pair of craft beer. On her, they make local excellent climbs, tasting and then we did for some, healthy, active, some other more modern adults. Hikes. They use certified um, all-organic she, grains, gave me an ex- and an each can of non-alcoholic beer is only between so 50 that was and 70 calories. We have IPA, Glenelg, Stouts, and tons of seasonal offerings. Recently, they actually just took home a gold medal at the U.S. Open Beer. It gives me an opportunity for, for hop me IPA. to unplug. If you would like to get your hands have on some, some you, know, you can time save fifteen percent space without having to worry about whether or not com. I need athletic to be doing something brewing. else. The best and just, tasting you know, way to keep have, your promises. Have a little bit of, of, of mental relaxation. 
concentrate on and something else. And also want to else. thank concentrate our sponsor, CS Instant step, Coffee, rather, rather for than making this what show other happen. Piece of paper they make 100% Arabica Instant Coffee. They use compostable packaging, and each package makes about 20 ounces of coffee. So I'll take one of those with me on an overnight trip, and it makes two pretty good-sized cups of coffee. And it's an awesome feeling knowing I can just throw that in my backpack Find some hot water, and I'm good to go. Save 20% by using the code ADVENTURE at csinstant.coffee. So what about hypothermia? I mean, you're doing a lot of winter trips. You must have learned a, a fair amount about that. Yeah, I, um, you know, I, like I said earlier on, I do, I do perspire a lot. So, you know, your clothes get wet. Um, you know, that was one of, that's one of the things, especially on, you know, if you read anything about the 100 mile wilderness hikes and how much, you know, you ex- how much energy you exert, you're wet, you're wet, whether you're you know, crossing over a ravine and it's still rushing water, you're, you're, it's just a wet trip. And I usually like to get to a place halfway through the hike, whatever day hike we're going for, and change my shirts. And, and so, you know, I try to find, you know, a location in the trees where I could take my two shirts off and put on two dry shirts. And last year, and I usually move pretty quickly. Last year, I didn't move so quickly. And then all of a sudden, my hands started to get, um, blue. And um, even with the the heat warmers I had, and even with dry gloves, I couldn't get my hands um, to stop hurting. And it, it took a really long time. I'm not talking a long time on the trip. I'm talking days after the trip for me to start getting normal feeling in the tips of my fingers. Mm. Uh, because hyperthermia can become a real big problem. Uh, you need to make sure that you bring dry clothes, dry socks, dry gloves. That is, and, 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 you know, funny thing about it, hyperthermia just doesn't happen in the wintertime. You can have hyperthermia in a summer hike, especially in the, um, especially in that area of the AT, oh, because yeah. there is, there's basically two seasons on that hike, depending on the elevation you're on. So you can certainly get hypothermia in the summertime, depending on what the temperature is at the elevation you're at, if you don't, if you don't watch yourself. And hypothermia is, boy, it's, I'm going to call it deceitful. And the reason is because when your uh, brain temperature starts to drop, which happens when blood that's been cooled with the rest of your body ends up in your brain, then it impacts your ability to reason and make wise decisions. And that's the scariest part about it. That's why it's so important to stay warm and not allow yourself to get cold. You think, I'm just going to muscle through. Well... Different people have different limits and susceptibilities to the the effects of hypothermia. And and realize that, um, you know, getting out there and going for a hike, you're going to exert energy. It's okay to to practice before you go. Understand that you are going to exert a lot of energy and bring a change of gloves. Bring, make sure you have the appropriate amount of water with you. I can't stress that enough to make sure that you have a good amount of water with you and and some nutrition. Make sure it's stuff that you can eat that has nutritional value and and that you have it in your pack and it's readily available to you. I carry I also carry a spot which is a locator device that right. you know cuz I'm out pretty far for a while and if I get into trouble I want, you know, at least, you know, a fighting chance of somebody to be able to find me. So, so. of the people that you've introduced to this idea of winter backpacking, um, what have been their, their responses to it? 
Um, what, what's their first response? Yeah. You know, why? Why, <laughs> why would you do this? And, and, and it's funny because most people who do it will answer this, the question the exact same way. And, and, and that is because I can. Mm. Yeah. That's almost because it's there, you know, the, the answer to why climb the mountain, right? Because it's there. Right. Exactly right. <laughs> Yep. And we had a mountain that we, we finally got over last year and it took me three years to do it. I, I uh, you know, you get to a certain point up the mountain and the wind is just blowing down at you to a point where it's just not possible to make it up. And you, you go back down and you either try it a different day or you try it a different year. And it took me three years. It was a certain section of the mountain. I just the wind was just, you know, too much to bear and the cold was too much to bear. And finally, last year, I said, look, um, I've worked hard enough in the off season to get here. And if it takes me a little longer, I'm, I'm going to get to the top of this. Isn't that kind of exciting when you have something that keeps denying you and you, you make safe choices, you turn around, you go back another day to try again, but then yeah. because of the repeated efforts, it's almost that much more rewarding when finally everything comes together and you make it to the top. Yeah, that's exactly right. Absolutely. That there is no better feeling when you get up there and, you know, you say this, 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 this is a reason as to why I did this. And, and I can, I, I can, I can make it up there. Right. And it's okay. It's okay. If it doesn't work out, you just make good choices and say, you know what, it wasn't meant to be right now, but I will be back. Yeah, absolutely. I have had instances when the weather wasn't as good as we wanted. And, and we just said, you know what, forget about the summit. Let's go for a hike and see what happens. Right. And uh, sometimes those are the best experiences. And sometimes you still summit, which is amazing. You know, you wouldn't expect to, but you get your weather window somehow and it happens. That's right. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, but that's just kind of it. In the wintertime especially, it's safety first. You have to make wise decisions. But if you're still willing to at least try to say, okay, we may not get to where we thought we were going, but we can certainly take a walk and see what happens, you know. That's, it's just such a rewarding thing to get out there to experience it in all the different types of weather and conditions. I think that for me personally, that's part of what it's all about. I would agree with you. It's uh, just being out there on its own is, uh, is enough of a reward. So I interviewed a fellow uh, over a year ago who had been trying to climb Mount Washington in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. And he, it took him several attempts. We're on the subject, so I might as well bring it up. What turned him around sure. the first time was that his goggles frosted over and he couldn't see. And so it cost him the mountain. It cost him the summit that day. And you sure. invented here something that can address that called Sven Can See, and it's the, the mass defog stuff. Give us kind of a feel for how that works. It's a gel that's designed to keep water fog molecules from actually forming together to create fog and which then ultimately, depending on the temperature, turns to frost. And my experience was on a hike where I was just so frustrated because you take your goggles and they fog up. And then what's the first thing you do when your goggles, your glasses fog up? You put them on the top of your head. <laughs> it makes it worse. Once you do that, you're done. Yeah. They frost up because, you know, that's what it's going to do and, and you're done. And when you're out, especially on these bitter cold trips, what what – I don't know if folks really get is you can get sunburn on your eyes. Sure. Um, the, the glare off the ice and the snow really um, is uh, is important to keep uh, keep in mind that it can really hurt you and your face and your eyes. And then, of course, all the dangers and the stuff can, can, that can end up in your eyes. You need eye protection. But if you can't see where you're going, the first, you don't get to enjoy the reason why you're out there in the first place. And second, you really can't see where you're walking and what you're stepping on. And I was on a trip once where it just got to be so frustrating. Um, I tried the, the items that were on the market that, you know, that people had recommended. And either they had isopropanol in it or they were you know, a wax kind of situation. And nothing was able to manage the temperatures and the, and the needs that I had. And, I, you know, and I really, quite honestly, I thought it was just me. I really did because, you know, I, it was only a couple of years into my into my do in my hiking. And I really did think it was just me until I met another guy who was on the trail on, on a trail and he came across him. And he, he said he was cross country skiing and he said to me, oh, my God, my glasses keep fogging up. I can't even see where I'm going. And at that point, I realized, OK, well, maybe it isn't just me. 
And uh, that's where that's where my quest came to find, you know, a, a better solution. Well, I, I have an issue when I ski on a very, very cold day. And it could be backcountry skiing, cross-country skiing, or alpine skiing. It really doesn't matter. But I always want to have some sort of a face mask so that I don't get frostbite right. on my nose sure. or my cheeks, you know. And as soon as I put a face mask on, then some of my breath starts to go north, and I lose my visibility. I, instantly, my goggles fog up. I have a high bridge right. on my nose, so there's no way I can seal my goggles and keep that out. So I've been looking for something that would work. Because it's just a, it's a real bummer when you can't see. It, it ruins all your fun. Yeah. So the first product that I created, the first, we, we have a, 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 a few versions of the Sven Can See branded products. And the first one I came out with, which, of course, when I did this, I, I originally designed it for me, right? Because I was, you know, I was the one who needed the, you know, the, the, the product. So I made it for me. And the first product I came out with works to 20 below zero, because that's what I needed. I needed something that did extreme cold. And, you know, it, it's a very small amount of product. You put it on both sides of the lenses, but you had to wait 10 minutes for it to really dry, you know, dry. And then you'd buff it out with a, you know, a micro cloth and then it works great. It works marvelous. You know, um, somebody was out there doing ultimate type work, you know, that they're out in the cold, extreme cold, love the product. But, you know, for, for, you know, folks that weren't in 20 below zero, they didn't want to, you know, they didn't need the 10 minute wait. So the other product that we have is, uh, is a, what we call a spray wipe and go. You just spray it on both sides of the lens as you wipe it off and you're good to go for the day. Um, both of the products are, are biodegradable. Both of them are coconut based. Um, they have no fumes, no odor, nothing that's going to burn your eyes. Um, so you can use it and, you know, we try to teach our, our younger kids how to take care of their own gear. You can feel comfortable that a younger person is going to put it on their own goggles or glasses and be fine with it. It's not going to hurt them. They can stick their fingers in their mouth. It's not going to bother them. Oh, good. So what are the, the limitations of the product? If you, if someone said, well, will it work for this or that? What would, what would you say? These are when it might be limited. Yeah. One of the things that we're, we're working on right now is for folks that wear prescription glasses underneath their goggles. See, because, you know, when you put your goggles on your face or you put glasses on your face, you're creating a, a, what we call a closed environment. It's a space between you and your glasses or your face and your glasses that create that, that pick up the ambient temperature and you're creating energy and that's what creates the fog in the first place. But when you put glasses inside of glasses, you have what we call a double closed environment or two, two environments inside one another. And we can control one, but we're working on trying to control both. And, and that's really hard. Um, and it's really something that a lot of people struggle with because I've, I've been, you know, I've met a lot of people over the last group of years that do just that. They wear glasses prescription lenses underneath their goggles. And, and it's one of the biggest issues they have, and it's something that we're working on right now to resolve. Hmm. Okay. So is the product water soluble? Can you wash it yes. off? If it rains, does, is that an issue? Um, so it is what we call hydrophilic and not hydrophobic. So unlike a product like rain that you put on your windshield, uh, this is hydrophilic. So um, it, will, it will wash off. So let's say, for instance, somebody wanted to use our product to go scuba diving. Um, we, we say dry and reapply. So you're going to apply it to a dry mask. And if you come up from a dive and you rinse off all your gear, you need to dry, dry off the inside of your mask and reapply it. Because you're going to love me on your first dive, dive and you're going to hate me on your second one if you don't. Mm, okay. um, because the water will cause it to wash off. However, interesting thing is if you're skiing and you're going down, you know, you're doing – uh, skiing down a mountain and they've got the ski machine, the snow machines going, you will be fine. It is not going to come off the lenses. Okay. Now the product needs to be reapplied each day, especially in cold temperatures. But if you are, you know, if you're hiking or, or mountain biking or whatnot in, you know, in the spring or summer or fall, you'll get a couple of days out of it where versus the winter time, you'll only get one. You'll, you'll, you'll get a whole day out of it, but it does re require reapply, reapplying it the next day. So what makes Spin Can See better from other products that are out there? Well, you know, let's go back to chemistry class when we were kids where uh, rubbing alcohol, which is really what isopropyl alcohol is, it, it caused water to evaporate. And that's where the whole, the, the initial idea of an anti-fog product came from. 
The problem with, uh, with isopropanol or isopropyl alcohol is that it doesn't stick to anything. So you spray it on something and it just runs away. It'll cause water to, you know, to dissipate or evaporate, but it will not cause it, it, there's no way it will adhere to the lenses that you need it to adhere to to keep the water from the, the fog molecules from bonding together. So that's really one of the, one of the key pieces of Svenkensy is that it's a surfactant and, and it's an invis- we basically create an invisible layer on your lens to keep the water molecules from bonding together. Mm, okay. Well, I'm just kind of curious. I'm sitting here thinking now, what sports do I need this for? I've already mentioned skiing in, in the wintertime. You mentioned scuba diving. Uh, my mask fogging up when I scuba dive has always been a challenge. Uh, what other sports really benefit from this? Um, cyclists. Cyclists, runners, golfers. Um, there are a multitude. Every sport that you would wear a sun, wear sunglasses where there could be fogging is a sport that you would wear them in. It, you know, it takes it to a whole other level, though. Really funny because when I created this product, I really designed it for winter sports, never really thinking about the other uses of the product, which is industrial, first responders, high, dental hygienists. There are so many other folks out there that use our product that, quite frankly, I didn't even anticipate when I was designing it from in the beginning. But the biggest sport is hockey. The really? hockey folks absolutely love our product. Oh, yeah, every day. Okay, I get it, I guess. You know, they're they're giving off a lot of heat. They're sweating a lot, and they're over ice in a cold environment. So, yeah, and they have to see. Well, it isn't just the folks that are playing the sport. It's their parents that are standing there watching the sport because there's actually – multiple temperatures going on in an ice rink right and there's so many opportunities for fogging not only just for the players but for the folks that are watching the game that are close to the ice so you know it it, that was an eye-opener for me because i wasn't a hockey player but folks that play hockey absolutely love our product i get it makes sense one thing that kind of pops into my mind here is that you turned 40 you decided to challenge yourself you took up a new sport In doing this new sport, you found a problem. You went about to solve the problem for yourself. Now it's turned into a business where you now have a product that you can solve other people's problems with. And it's all because you decided to step out of your comfort zone and go challenge yourself. Yeah, I think about that piece a lot. And, and, you know, people ask me along the way, um, you know, where this, you know, where the product came from and, you know, going back to how, how it became a, a product out of necessity and how the necessity came out of, you know, my desire to get out of my comfort zone later in life. Um, it's really kind of cool. Well, I think that's another reason why adventure sports just makes sense. You know, we're always telling people get out there and have some fun. We say enlarge your life, go make some memories, build some community, get healthier, get active. There are all sorts of benefits, but there are all these things that happen that uh, people wouldn't automatically think about. You know, right. so many businesses agree. have been born out of having new experiences. You know, if life seems like it's kind of just on the treadmill, go have a new experience. Absolutely. Right. Well, Scott, neat stuff. So if somebody wanted to get into winter backpacking, then what would your recommendation be? What should they do to get started? Um, first, get an idea as to where you want to try going hiking. Second, either go on a guided trip or go with a buddy. Uh, third, go to your local independent gear shop, talk to somebody who's maybe hiked the trail that you're considering hiking, knows the gear that you need, will take the time to explain the gear to you and what gear is different than other gear and why you should have one over the other. And, you know, make sure you've got a good water bottle, make sure you've got good boots um, and, and pay attention to the weather. It's okay to say, I'm going to go another day, but, but really just you know, get out there, um, give it a try, get out of your comfort zone, and, and you're going to experience something that you've never experienced before, and you certainly won't if you if you don't just say, I'm going to try this. Yeah, absolutely. I think for winter sports like these, there are two potential dangers that everybody should make sure that they have some awareness of, and that's hypothermia and avalanche danger if you're in the mountains. Yeah. Yeah, those two things are critical, and obviously route finding is a big one as well, because mm-hmm. getting lost and not being able to get back to your shelter, it, you should be prepared to spend the night out there if you're going, yeah. but you want to make definitely. sure you know that you can find your way. So learn how to do route finding when the trail's obscured, when the visibility is poor, 
that's, you know, those are really the three essentials, I would say, for expanding your adventures into the winter season. I, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, making sure that you you have, you know, backup gear and, you know, some, you know, nutrition in your pack. Make sure that people know where you're going, that, you know, what time you're planning on leaving, what time is the expected time to be back, approximately where you're going, where are you starting, um, makes a big difference. Make sure you have your phone charged. Don't leave, don't leave on a hike without a fully charged cell phone. Those are your important pieces, especially on a win- especially on a winter hike. Sure, you bet. And I would like to encourage all of our fair weather hikers out there to maybe consider pushing the season a little bit. It opens up a whole new world. And, you know, Scott, one of my favorite experiences is to go to a place that's been overused in the summer. You know, you go there and you love it, but it's like, wow, man, it's just kind of tragic the way that this has been kind of torn up by too much love. You know what I mean? I do. But you go there in the wintertime, it's pristine. It's yeah, and, beautiful. And there's not too many people out there. It's, it's amazing how few people you see on the trail in the wintertime. Um, many a time, you know, we, we have the trail to ourselves for, for nine hours and don't run into anybody. Yeah. Yeah. And then in the summertime, I tend to go deeper into the wilderness so that I have more of that, uh, alone, all natural kind of a feeling, you know, but in the wintertime, I'll go to the places that in the summer are kind of overrun because I know that I'll still have that, uh, that sense of solitude that I'm thirsting for. You're very, very right. Um, and you're going to experience things in the wintertime. Uh, it's a whole different view. It's, it's nature and, and a whole different light. I, I got an experience once to stand in the middle of a waterfall because it, you know, it had frozen over. So the water is rushing down underneath this, you know, encasement of ice. And I'm standing in the middle of it as, as it's running underneath me. Mm. Um, it was that to me is one of you know one of my fondest memories of all the trips I've had, and you can't you know you would never be able to experience something like that if you go in the summertime. Yeah, absolutely. And the way that that water freezes and stuff, you, you'll see ice formations that you can't even describe to anybody. You try to take a picture, but still, it, it, it it's like wow, I mind blowing natural art that you can't just walk by. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sometimes sometimes the trips take a little bit longer than you anticipated because you're, you know, stopping to take things in. And, you know, I I have to one of the things I work on is I look down a lot. I'm constantly trying to see where I'm walking and what I'm doing. And it takes a little bit more energy for me to lift up my head and look forward rather than looking down, especially in the wintertime where I'm constantly trying to watch where I'm walking. Um, but you know, it takes me a little while longer to get to some places because I stop a lot. I want to see where I am and, and take in the views that, that I've come out here for. Right. It's, 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 it's very exciting. I'm really looking forward to my trip that's coming up, and, and I look forward to it every year. Well, you know, we're about to run out of time, but we need to tell the listeners where they can get Sven Can See because I'm sure that some of them are going to say, yeah, I have that problem. I want to try it. Yeah, um, we really love to um, you know service you right there on the Sven Can See website. All the products are there. Uh, we can you know you can certainly buy the product there. You can certainly buy it um, if you can't buy it at your local independent retailer. Go in and ask them if they have Sven Can See. If not, you know tell them they should. We we are always looking for new independent dealers and new dealers to carry our product. But you can always find us on the Sven Can See website. And that is S V E N can com. Well, first of all, Correct. thank you so S-V-E-N much for listening to this episode. It really well, means thank the you world for sharing with us. us you want to spend your, your world time of with us. winter backpacking if you'd like and winter to help camping. Us further, please just I think leave that us a review it is iTunes, much more fun and much more media, doable than most us. people think. You, can become a you know, a lot of people just think that sounds nuts, but I think what you shared are a lot of the reasons why it's not nuts. You know, it's an amazing experience. So thanks for sharing that with us. Reach out. We're all Thank you for having me. It's been good, uh, really been wonderful. I really appreciate it. Stories. Oh, you bet. And lastly, well, thank you listeners to our out there, whose if you haven't tried winter right camping, now. winter backpacking, Athletic it takes it to a whole new level. But man, is that a, a majestic, wonderful beer. level? It's a lot. Go to their of fun. website so at athletic. Do give it a shot. Com. Maybe do it this code way in our spring. show notes to but save fifteen percent on your first you order. It. Get out there. After all this adventure talk, if you're needing some gear yourself, but you need some advice before buying. 
Go to backpacktribe.com where you can ask questions to the owners who have experience with all the gear as well as all of it for sale right there on their website.